so a very good evening and warm welcome to one and all those who have joined for today's session and in spite of the holiday uh, so you people have joined so first of all happy holy and of the on the eve of omens day so i want to wish all the beautiful omens who are present here so happy omens day to all of you so considering omen health this is a very important topic uh, we need to discuss it is the time very important time for us to discuss because out of every 10 omen eight omen are suffering in their menstrual phase they are suffering from pcos or pcod so today we will be discussing on the brief about the things and how PCOS can be managed with the help of sleep cycling. So that is also very, very important thing to be discussed now. So hope my voice is audible. Anyone can say uh, because I cannot see anyone. So I yes, will go yes, to the, sir. yeah. So I will inv invite all the uh, uh, like speakers for today to come on the camera so that we can introduce them so moving forward to the next slide please so on behalf of cognized nutrition i am shomindu ghosh clinical dietitian and diabetes educator welcomes you all so our first speaker is miss arunima she is also a practicing dietitian and nutritionist she has completed her graduation from uh, food and nutrition from university of Bardhaman and msc from the university of calcutta she is also ugc net qualified and WBC set qualified certificate diabetes educator from National Diabetes Educator Project. That is a 10 month course and six month internship from the Nehru Memorial Techno Global Hospital. Former nutrition faculty, she has worked in VLCC Institute for uh, like uh, uh, two years there. And uh, health and wellness coach at Goki right now. She is also our students of Cognized Nutrition and recently she has completed our course. So now moving to our next speaker, that is Onurima Das. She is also a practicing dietitian. She has completed her master's from Indira Gandhi Open University in Dietetics and Food Service Management, completed her grades. She has completed her six month hospital internship from AMRI Hospital, Dhakuria, completed deep diet, and also former uh, uh, attached with VLCC Institute and completed three months internship from there. She is also a diabetes educator uh, from National Diabetes Educator Project, that is Dr. Mohans, and former intern nutritionist at Bowfit Online Fitness Center. She is also our nutrition student at Cognized Nutrition. Moving to our next speaker, that is Dishani Misra. Ms. Dishani Misra is BSc in Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics. She is gold medalist from Gokhal Memorial Girls College, Kolkata. She is Masters in Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics from SNDT Oman University, Mumbai. She is also Certificate Diabetes Educator from NDEP. Professional cert certification she has done from the University of Copenhagen, Stanford, School of Medicine and Ludwig Maxillian University of Munich. And she is also currently dietitian intern at Nanavati Max Super Specialty Hospital. Everybody know how famous is the hospital. And she is doing the internship from there in Mumbai, Maharashtra. So uh, welcome all the speakers. And first, I would like to invite Orunima to just discuss in brief about what is actually PCOS. What is the difference between PCOS and PCOD? So about the pathophysiology, we need to know a little bit because today, due to the crunch of time, we may not discuss too much about the pathophysiology. So Arunima, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this amazing opportunity to present an amazing topic like sleep cycling. And as always, I'd like to express my gratitude towards you for giving me this platform of Cognize and uh, introducing us such a well manner. Well, uh, as you know, today is a very uh, happy holiday for us. This is the day of Holi. Thank you all the attendees who have joined us amidst this day. Let's celebrate this holy with the color of nature. As you know, nature itself is the best physician and it has told none other by our hypocrites. The person who is known as the father of nutrition and who has said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Can I get to the next slide, please, sir? 
Well, thank you so much for that. You know, Mother Nature has always been so loving to us from, uh, you know, fulfilling the basic amenities of our food and the basic needs. It has given us many opportunities to serve ourselves. In that way, in some of the cases like hormonal imbalances of women, we can even get rid of that by following the nature only. Okay. Can I get the marker, please, sir? Well, this is not possible right now. You can continue. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, uh, the already sir said like amidst uh, 10 women uh, of reproductive age group, eight has been diagnosed as PCOS. There are so many cases which are still uh, undiagnosed. So in all those cases, we may find many of the options available like hormonal treatment is there, some medications are there. You know, sometimes uh, doctors ask uh, for the surgical procedures, but let's think a little bit out of the box and that out of the box is seed cycling. We all know seed means uh, root or the basic things from where a new life can generate. So from where the new life can generate from there, some new way to explore some uh, suitable findings to cure our disease. Why not? Right. Basically, seed cycling is something that is a uh, including four of the seeds in a rotational basis that has already been mentioned in the slide flax seeds sunflower seeds sesame and pumpkin seeds as well so two at a go and rest of the two at a go within the duration of 15 days each okay can i go to the next slide please well the specific target uh, disease that has been mentioned here is actually the pcos and pcod as well PCOS is the acronym that we all know. It stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And uh, the basic feature of this is uh, basically the menstrual problems, because already I have told that this is basically the women uh, who are on their reproductive age group. They are suffering from that. Well, anovulation is there, oligomenorrhea or, you know, very abnormal uh, periods they are getting, like uh, less than eight or sometimes uh, less than six in a whole year, there must be problem of conception uh, because uh, of the infertility issues they are facing. And obviously the hyperandrogenism is there. Well, we cannot forget the amenorrhea as well that they are, uh, you know, not getting periods at all. And in the hyperandrogenism, we can find hirsutism like excessive facial hair, acne, male pattern, baldness, etc. Let's get into the next slide. Well, so this is an interesting slide where we can find like we all are having some of our nicknames. So these are the nicknames of your PCOS. Functional ovarian hyperthyroidism. At the name, uh, it's uh, suggesting itself. You can find ovarian hyperandrogenism is something where we can find the androgen excess or the excess of the testosterone or kind of male hormone in our female body. Well, ovarian hyperthicosis is another name, implies the same meaning in case of PCOS, where the theca cell excess can be found. The sclerocystic ovarian syndrome, again, the other name we can call PCOS. So uh, sclerocystic means here the cysts become so tight and the reproductive function diminishes, actually. And about the stain Leventhal syndrome, well, let it be uh, unveiled in the next slide. Please go to the next slide, sir. Before going to the next slide, uh, as I have promised you, I will tell you why the stain Leventhal syndrome. We would uh, need to wait for a little bit. But before that, let's clear the doubt between PCOS and PCOD. Although this is used synonymously, but there is a basic difference. As you can find uh, here, the deposition of mature eggs occur, where in PCOS it might not be. Because of the androgen access, this immature eggs cannot actually ovulate or, you know, just go out from its origin. And that cycle goes on. The Because of the progesterone, uh, you know, sometimes the progesterone suppressing nature is there, particularly in case of PCOD, you can find that the egg, mature egg stays there. Well, some other thing that is associated with the PCOD is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is a genetic disorder uh, that can be evident from the menarche. And uh, sometimes it is found that the cortisol excess is not there. You know, in some cases you can find uh, in PCOS or PCOD cases, 
some uh, cortisol excess is there and some stress hormone increased up but in pcod cases particularly in the cah or congenital adrenal hyperplasia there is less cortisol production and in response to to that the progesterone indominance or the progesterone suppressing effect can be found as a result you can find no ovulation there well go into the next slide please sir here comes the unveiling portion this is the reason why we can call PCOS as stain level thumb syndrome. They are the persons who put the first slide. You know, from the ancient timing, menses or menstruation has always been considered some unholy thing or, you know, something uncanny, mysterious things. So they put the first slide and they say, no, this is a complete natural phenomenon. And in honor to their name, we call them as stain level thumb syndrome. Please go to the next slide, sir. Well, this is something we need to know. This is the etiology or causative factor. Well, as we are well versed with that topic, genetic basis always play a role in case of PCOS. Because of that same thing, the blood relatives of the patient uh, who is undergoing the PCOS have great chance to get that disease later on life. Basically, the gene that coded the insulin receptor and the insulin itself found some kind of suppressed there and as a result of that the sex hormone binding globulin or the shbg here you can found uh, that cannot bind actually the androgen or the testosterone and the defects evolves well there are other predisposing factors as well that can contribute to the disease family history i have already told you Obesity always plays a role because where there is obesity, you know, there comes insulin resistance. Well, high level of maternal androgen, as it can cross the placenta, it can go into the uh, growing fetus body. That is a risk factor as well. The other thing you can find insulin resistance and T1DM. Obviously, the genetic factor comes again on the page. And uh, the anti-epileptic drugs like Valporate they actually induces the obesity and in turn so it is causing the pcos please go to the next slide well here i have put a graph uh, there you can find that india is like uh, here also uh, like the diabetes capital it has already become it has become a capital for diagnosed pcos cases of 22.7 percent you can find the topmost well the blue line uh, actually encoding the non-diagnosed. So this is not a very less number, 11.8%. Well, go to the next slide, please. Okay, very known. Still, uh, let's have a look there. Hyperandrogenism is the most common thing as we have already discussed. Insulin resistance, anovulation, or uh, no chances at all for ovulation. Non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Because whenever there is insulin resistance, though insulin is present, but the insulin is kind of blind. So it cannot actually recognize the glucose and send that back into the cells again for energy production. Well, there must be LH hypersecretion or luteinizing hormone hypersecretion. That is actually dominating the FSH and the, anovulation and the ovulation procedure hampers. Well, the acyclic estrogen production, uh, we will go into the later on stage and find why this is called. Well, polycystic ovaries, we are already talking about that. The FSH-LH ratio, something to worry about. The ideal is 1 is to 1. But here in that cases, sometimes you found like uh, it goes into 4 is to 1. Like LH becomes 4 and FSH becomes 1. But this is not the scenario that should be. And uh, there might be, not for everybody, but might some cases where we have found that there might be gluten and insensitivity. So gluten is actually causing much inflammation in the body. Well, spartan hyperglycemia might be because of the insulin resistance. Well, before moving into the next slide, I would like to draw your attention to the USG of that uh, uh, two persons where we can find a normal ovary and a patient with polycystic ovary. Uh, suddenly, your oh, voice is not coming, Arunima. The... Yes, sir. Arunima, 
just from last uh, few seconds we are unable to hear your voice just you can okay. again repeat the pcos and pcod what you were saying just just few minutes back well so i was uh, just uh, am is my av yeah. clear now sir yeah. and yeah. everybody all right thank you so much for the information sir well i was just talking about the hyperandrogenism how testosterone excess happen in the body why insulin resistance is found and how that is causing the non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus because insulin is being blind or unable to find out the receptor of the glucose how anovulation happens and LH hypersecretion I talked about that well I talked how the FSH and LH ratio hampers while the ideal being one is to one here we can find sometimes the LH becomes four and the FSH becomes one so something to worry about well, there might be gluten insensitivity uh, because inflammation is presenting and starting hyperglycemia as a result of insulin resistance. After that, I was just uh, highlighting about two pictures where I have shown a normal ovary and picture of a polycystic ovary. The pearl shaped picture that has been found here that is called string of structure. This is because of the cysts present in the ovary. Well, may I go to the next slide, sir? Well, you can find the symptoms there. Everyone knows about that. Hirsutism or excess male pattern, you know, facial hair that is found up to 80% of age patients. Because uh, before going into the symptom, here you can find obesity 70% of patients who are obese. Why I'm highlighting that? Because nowadays it has been more evident that 20% of patients who are getting PCOS are lean as well. So where to worry about? Well, discuss on later slide here you can find acanthosis nigricans or the black patches over the neck and you know sometimes in the chin areas that is because of the insulin resistance infertility maximum of the cases you can find this irregular periods oligomenorrhea or absence of periods or amen amenorrhea will already be there many a uh, person is suffering from abdominal cramp well severe acne that is again a cause for your hyperandrogenism the painful menstrual bleeding and abdominal cramp I have already discussed. Weight gain or obesity is already on the plate. Well, cravings for sugar as there might be a chance of getting diabetes later on. And uh, thinning of hair and male pattern badness along with the lower libido or low sexual desire might be present. Please go into the next slide, sir. Well, here comes actually we have already talked about how insulin resistance is helping. The prime factors basically is the insulin resistance and high androgen productions. These are totally interconnected. The more insulin resistance will be there, the more high androgen you will get. Well, insulin, uh, there might be no absence of insulin in your When the body is getting the signal that I get into your cell, so it will keep producing, the pancreas will keep producing the insulin. But unfortunately being blind, the insulin is not recognizing the glucose. Well, the more the insulin, because we know insulin is something anabolic hormone. So it can induce your obesity and the more insulin, there might be less amount of sex hormone binding globulin due to the defect of that insulin in your body, particularly uh, in terms of PCOS or PCOD cases. So you can find the high androgen production due to that, due to that fact, when the androgen production is more, the estrogen will automatically be lower because when one is up, the second might be dominated. Well, uh, I think we should go into the next slide because here we have already discussed about that the male pattern. You can find how the process is happening. This is just nothing but a flowchart. And you can find uh, the insulin resistance, how it is you know, damaging the skin like hirsutism, you can find acne and acanthosis nigricans is there and how endometrial hyperplasia hyperplasia is nothing but the you know increase in the cell number well anovulation and amenorrhea how it is happening because of the same thing well please go into the next slide sir This is just a pictorial representation of menstrual cycle. We all are I'm not going much uh, in class. I would like to have the next Well, something to know. Here, 
for hormones. These are the major thing. So two of them, estrogen and progesterone, basically the ovarian hormone, and H and FSH, basically the pituitary hormone, secretes from the anterior pituitary. Well, these four are interrelated. In what cases? These two hormones. Uh, so just for better uh, network, just for better network, uh, okay. it is so okay you really right now about for better that. network, sometimes uh, you can switch off your video because from last two or three minutes, there is very much interruption in your voice. So you continue. If it is again repeated, I will request you to switch off your video. Okay, you continue. Right. Right. So, so as is event, I'm not uh, going much deeper into that uh, because uh, of crunch of time. I think we should go to the next day because we are well known about uh, what is estrogen, progesterone, LA and FSH. Atma? Just only to uh, say to the audience, those who are students, so it is very important yes. that uh, these are uh, these are the test, blood test we used to do. Right, right. So estrogen, yeah, we will on serum insulin. So that that will be discussed in the diagnosis part. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank we you have so separately much. added that. Well, uh, again, nothing but simple flowchart you can find. We have basically two cycles in the menstrual phases. That is your ovarian cycle and your uterine cycle. The ovarian cycle where uh, the happenings is uh, being happened in the uh, ovary where follicular phase and luteal phase, 1 to 14 days will be the follicular phase roughly. And uh, from 15 to uh, that onwards up to 30 days, that will be the luteal one. While in the uterine cycle, because we know actually the shading comes from the uterus, so periods and proliferative stage that is and later on after ovulation around the 14th of the day that will be the secretory phase from your uterine cycle okay i think we should move on to the next slide this is again a graph where i have shown which one is needed well um the fsh and lh how so while ovulation timing we actually need lh surge if LH surge is not there, no ovulation will be taking place. You can find a bland graph, like up to the 14th of the day, where actually the follicle is being matured. And from there, it is again dropping down. And the corpus luteum is forming. As we know, corpus luteum gives rise to progesterone. Well, uh, here it has been shown uh, about the estrogen. Till uh, the development of the mature follicle estrogen is needed, then the peak point again need to drop down. So that progesterone comes into the force. And here again, a very beautiful uh, graph you can find. This is the first day of menstruation. And from 1 to again the 29th or 28th of the day, again the menses has come. And this is the developing phases in different follicular and luteal phases. Well, please go into the next slide. A very beautiful slide you can just have a look nothing but the pictorial representation about what i said just fatma please uh, change the slide well here's something i need to show this is a regular menstrual cycle so actually we are discussing about what is the problematic region no? you can find that how the uh you know follicles is being developed when the follicle is being developed the graphene follicle uh, later on it will release the ovum, the progesterone will be picked up again, and then ovulation will happen and the cycle will go on on a normal basis. You can find how the LH surge is there and FSH surge will also be there. But in case of PCOS, you can find a flat graph. So there might not be any kind of LH surge, like FSH surge. LH surge is not uh, also not be there and FSH, the amount of FSH will also be dominant, like uh, it will be dominated by the uh, FSH, uh, sorry, LH. Okay. So we actually targeting that flat graph and through the seed cycling procedure, how that thing can be changed. This is the main motto. Well, go to the next slide. Uh, well, risk of pcos we are already know about that genetic plays a major role and something like premature adrenergy well oligoovulatory infertility type 1 or type 2 or gestational diabetes mellitus that also comes into force 
obesity and insulin resistance we already have talked much timing about that and for the valporate and other anti epileptic drugs what are the risk factors that you can find something to discuss here environmental toxins they are known as xenoestrogens xeno means something that is coming outside of the body here bisphenol a phthalates or something that is uh, you know used to produce some resin or chemical compounds some pesticides some environmental working groups or some kind of lead or some other heavy metals here comes other things like waste to heap ratio if you remember i have talked about lean pcos actually we need to check the waste to heap ratio whether it is perfect and overweight individuals having the bmi greater than 25 that is also increasing the risk please change the slide yeah that comes uh, to the last of diagnosing the pcos so uh, already sir has mentioned uh, which one uh, kind of thing we need to worry about we need to check the testosterone level generally the testosterone level greater than uh, 9 nanogram per ml is really a matter of worry and uh, luteinizing hormone we also need to check and the value should be uh, less than 80 unit per liter well multiple seeds are there uh, generally greater than 12 seeds uh, is a indicator and uh, the seeds generally varies between 2 to 9 mm well if it is more than that we need some operative procedure and this is the process of diagnosing like you can find uh, just by checking uh, the clinical things uh, as we often do by our naked eye like checking the acne checking for the hirsutism here uh, we are having a scale called ferryman galway scale where greater than 8 means you are having serious hirsutism issue you can find the pelvic exam usg is already there the transvaginal ultrasound and some other lab testing for the pcos shbg or sex hormone binding globulin must be there the total free and uh, bat and dht is something dehydrotestosterone we call that as very much potent form of testosterone and very much worrying thing well that is dihydroxy ap androsterone sulfate that can also be measured these are something some intermittent thing in the uh, you know progression of the testosterone and estrogen production you can find prolactin is there fasting insulin fasting glucose lh and fsh might be there okay with that i am concluding my part and i would like to hand over my presentation to miss dishani dishani over to you yeah thank, thank you, you arjuna okay. uh, for a nice description of the diagnosis about the uh, like pathophysiology how pco is happening now with the help of diet lifestyle modifications everything will be discussed by dishani so can we have dishani then at the end we will discuss seed cycling so you have to stay with us for more 20 minutes well thank you so much ulima you have given a really in depth insight of the entire disease like the disease condition itself the etiology the risk factors and also the diagnosing criteria the signs and symptoms so maybe our audience has got a well versed background of the entire disease so maybe our audience could be thinking like is the disease even curable or it's a lifelong burden so to your little dismay uh, it's fortunately uh, curable and it's not a lifelong burden you will definitely have a management for pcos and when intervened at the right time definitely pcos is reversible to the healthy lifestyle condition so what i'll be focusing on is the four pillars of management of pcos the first pillar being the medical management obviously for any kind of disease we know that the first intervention strategy that we opt for is the medical management so that stands to be the first pillar secondly i'll be talking about the dietary and lifestyle modification now we being dietitians and nutritionists we know that how important aspect it is to counsel our patients regarding this particular management of pcos so we'll be talking about it in the later slides the third being the weight management definitely that needs to be a, a concern for the pcos patients and that needs to be modulated accordingly the fourth being the hormonal treatment which has gained momentum in uh, nearly the last few decades i would say uh, based on the discoveries that are being done in the hormonal treatment the pills that are getting into uh, by all the modes of treatment or the etiology of pcos that we have known is actually an uh, a disease of hormonal imbalances so definitely hormonal treatment has gained momentum in the last few decades so may i request the next slide please okay so 
as I said, medical management being the very first line of treatment. Now, what exactly are the drugs we'll be focusing on? So the group of drugs that we'll be focusing on is the bicunites. And the most important class of drugs that we'll be talking about is definitely metformin. So to most of them, metformin is actually a drug that we are using for diabetes, that is type 2 diabetes. But it is also an important drug that we'll be discussing now in regards with PCOS as well. Let us now talk about how exactly is its mechanism or course of action, like how is it healing PCOS, in what manners. The very first intervention. It's like initial intervention is mostly in obese and overweight individuals. Now, as we know, most of the patients, over 90% of the patients, I would say, are either obese or overweight. So metformin targets on the body weight of the individual and helps in considerable lowering of the weight. Next point of action is obviously in improving the metabolic abnormalities. As we know, a hormonal imbalance is taking place in our body. So definitely the hormones will impact our regular metabolisms, that is the carbohydrate, fat and protein metabolisms predominantly. So these will get improved by metformin administration. Apart from that, it can even heal into the menstrual cyclicity, that is improving the cycles of our menses, and also has a potential in improving the pregnancy, that is the conception. Next important criteria of uh, administrating metformin is that it heals in insulin resistance. Now, as discussed by Arunima as well, that insulin resistance is an important complication that is occurring in PCOS. So definitely metformin targets this. Apart from that, it decreases the hyperinsulinemia, that is a high surge in insulin. Next, it also decreases the hepatic glucose production. As said that there is a liver production of glucose, even though there is a surge of insulin. So metformin targets into this respect as well. It decreases the glucose production and, and increases the peripheral glucose uptake and utilization by the cells so that the cells can optimally utilize glucose and produce energy. Another important course of action I'll be talking about is the antilipolytic effect. That is, it reduces the fatty acid concentration and gluconeogenesis. Now, as we know that fatty acid or adipocyte accumulation occurs in PCOS, so metformin targets this aspect as well and also reduces glucose formation from the non-carbohydrate sources, that is gluconeogenesis from fats and proteins. Researchers even claim that it aids in over 50% or more than 50% of patients in restoring the ovulation and menses. That is more than 50% or half the patients have actually gotten uh, results by use of metformin in their restoration of menses and ovulation aspect as well. Talking about further researches, it has also acclaimed that metformin can even enhance the efficacy of clomiphene for inducing the ovulation. Now, clomiphene is a drug that helps in overproduction in women who are actually not able to produce it naturally or may be facing some infertility issues. Here, I'd also like to highlight upon the contraindications, like in what conditions metformin cannot be used. Most importantly, it cannot be used in patients who are suffering from diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, even flatulence or indigestion, like any GI problem or any GI discomfort if the patient is encountering, we will not recommend having a metformin treatment in those cases. Even in some cases, such as in lactic acidosis, we'll restrict the use of metformin. May I request the next slide, please? So yeah, here comes the most important aspect that we as dietitians and nutritionists will be focusing on, the dietary modification. Now, it is like our very much core aspect that we'll be focusing on the counseling of the patient like what exactly they should be focusing on diet. Most importantly, it's important to focus that we cannot make right away changes or strict changes in their diet from the very beginning. We have to make small interventions each and every day so that they accept the dietary modifications and thereby restoring their hormonal disturbances and thereby even moving back to the healthy lifestyle. So what exactly we'll be focusing on? The most important aspect is focusing on a well-balanced diet. Now, what a well-balanced diet is, we overall, as we uh, are nutritionists, we definitely know. Having uh, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy and beans is definitely a balanced diet. We'll be focusing on each and every aspect, breaking these aspects and talking about what each of these components can heal the patient's symptoms. The first aspect is protein. We need to encounter the patients on having a 
high protein consumption, especially having high biological value proteins in terms of uh, lean meat, poultry, eggs, and restricting upon some amount of red meat consumption. We have to counsel the patient on having some amount of protein at least in every meal or snack. This can elevate the patient into having lowering of their blood sugar levels and healing in uh, insulin resistance as well. Talking about the another aspect or another component of the diet is omega-3 fatty acid. Now to most of our patients, it will be like a very important component which they won't be able to get. But to their uh, clarification, we can say that it is actually achievable. Now here you can see I have uh, written the few uh, rich sources of omega-3 fatty acids such as salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines and albacore tuna. Now these are some of the very rich sources. But it is also available in some of the household, like very common fishes that we consume. In our Bengali household, fish is a very common ingredient as we know. So even in those fishes like katla, rohu, uh, hilsa and pomfret, it is even rich in omega-3 fatty acid. We can focus on having these fishes as well. Talking about the seeds, as we will be focusing in the later on slides as well. We can ask them to have flax seeds, that is alsi in Hindi, or tishi as we say in Bengali. Pumpkin seeds, which is usually discarded from the vegetable sellers actually. We can ask them to restore this pumpkin seeds, clean that, dry them in the sun, and then roast a little bit and have that. Sesame seeds, which is very common in our Bengali households as well. Sunflower seeds, which has been popular in the recent demand as, the, as it says. Talking about even the oils canola, olive, peanut, or even research say that a combination of oils can even help in elevating the omega-3 fatty acid levels. And also, as we know, the nuts, especially almonds and walnuts, they are even great sources of omega-3 fatty acid. Another important aspect that we need to focus on the patient is to limit their consumption of the simple sugars and refined carbohydrates. Now, we need to make the patient understand why the entire PCOS has happened. It is mostly because of the lifestyle disorders they are practicing. Because of the busy and hectic lifestyle that we are into, we definitely have a restoration into consumption of most uh, available products that are in the market, the ready-to-eat products. And these products, as we know, are loaded with these simple sugars and refined carbohydrates. So it is our earnest duty to make the patient aware of the fact that what exactly are the products in these uh, ready-to-eat products and avoid them. We may counsel them on having more of whole wheat products or whole legumes, whole uh, 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 grains as well. And instead avoid white bread, pasta, rice, uh, refined sugar, beverages or caffeinated beverages such as uh, very commonly consumed among the youth being cappuccino, frappuccino, all these being very commonly consumed, especially in weekends as well. So this can be curtailed from the diet. Uh, could you please? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So these can elevate the blood, blood glucose level. But talking about overeating habits, we have to focus that they do not binge eat. Usually these patients have a habit of binge eating and we need to counter on this aspect of not binge eating. That is overeating should be avoided. Counseling on calorie free beverages has to be done. And instead of that, more of fruits, fruit juices, can be uh, included in their diet. Making aware that the patient has a consistent eating schedule is even important. Like they should have their dinner at least uh, by 8 or 8.30 and have a breakfast timing by at least 9 a.m., having a mid-morning snack, having lunch at least by 1 or 1.30. Like a regime should be followed. Not any haphazard meal consumption should be uh, uh, there in the patient. Therefore, this uh, propagated uh, meal timing should be instilled in the patient. Very important aspect that I'll be focusing on is monitoring the portion sizes. Now, whatever the curtailment has to be done gradually. But most important thing is mo monitoring the patient on the portion sizes. We can just make the curtailment on the portion sizes because on the initial stages, it won't be possible to just take away all the food that they are consuming, all the faulty diet that they are consuming. So just talking them about uh, making small changes on taking up small portions of the food that they are uh, having and diligently or gradually reducing the portion size will definitely make a change in their diet overall. Please move to the next slide. 
yeah another aspect being the lifestyle modification now apart from dietary modification what we need to diligently focus is the lifestyle modification overall we need to instill in the patient that physical activity or instilling some amount of physical exercise in their daily regime is very important uh, some kind of physical activity be it brisk walking for even 20 minutes should be encouraged in the patient initially we can ask the patient to have brisk walking for at least 20 minutes in a day maybe continuing it for three to four days a week gradually we can increase it for at least 30 minutes of brisk walking that can go for a week to all together ask the patient to instill at least one kind of physical activity for at least 21 days and from the 22nd day onwards you will see that it's just instilled in your daily routine it no longer remains a burden that oh we are instilling a, another activity in our daily routine how are we to uh, divide the time and do it in a separate time as well so automatically it becomes a habit in the patient's uh, daily regime talking about another aspect that is uh, what exercise can have benefits on so as we have talked about it increases the energy level and the fitness it improves the self confidence and motivation now, as we know these patients do suffer from some amount of lack of confidence because of the uh, outlook that they are having because of the facial acne the hirsutism that they are having the excess of body weight so that makes a lack of confidence in the patient and they do suffer from anxiety and depression to some extent in facing the world so some amount of physical activity not only generates a healthy dopamine or healthy secretion of uh, feel good hormones in the body that actually uh, reduces the level of stress hormones in the body which can be helpful in healing of PCOS talking about later on it reduces insulin resistance it also improves the menstrual cyclicity or regularity and aid, aiding into fertility overall as we know it also helps in the weight management or the weight loss of the patient which is very important aspect that we will be focusing now as we all know we need to uh, not just focus on the physical activity but also the entire day's regime of the patient like the most basic aspect we can focus is cutting down onto the usage of gadgets basically social media right before sleep we can ask the patient to have a modest sleep of at least eight hours in order to regularize the stress or the excess stress that they are having in their lifestyle that can actually reduce the hormonal imbalances and regularize their daily activities normalize their healthy habits uh, next slide please so as we talked about this entire weight ma uh, lifestyle modification into physical activities and uh, as well as uh, the dietary management, all these will definitely have an impact on the overall weight of the patient. Most of these patients do have a high weight, weight on the higher side as we know, are either obese or overweight, mostly having um, abdominal obesity, which leads to insulin resistance. So together with these activities, one can actually reduce the weight and have a, a reduction in the symptoms of PCOS. Now, there are other benefits to weight management because as researchers claim that even 5 to 10% of a weight reduction can have significant relief in the PCOS symptoms. So what exactly are the other reliefs? Let us focus on them. Very first being it's reducing the insulin and the testosterone level, that is the male androgen level. The next being regularizing the periods as said earlier as well improving the fertility and conception reducing the excess hair growth and that is the facial act, hair and the acne as well and improving the overall psychological well-being as discussed earlier the stress increases in these patients so overall reduction in the weight can elevate their confidence and self-confidence into focusing on the outer world they can present themselves with confidence to the outer world and be back to their normal lifestyle Researchers claim that even an excess of weight can have detrimental effects as we know. But in terms of PCOS, it can lead to risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases as well. And women who have suffered from PCOS and reduced their weight consider considerably had seen a relief in their symptoms of PCOS. But again, when there was a reversal of the weight, that is a weight gain was seen, the symptoms again returned. May I have the next slide, please? So yeah, this being the fourth pillar, as I talked about, the fourth pillar being hormonal treatment. Now, this has become a very top 
talking uh, treatment in the past four, uh, like two decades, as I talked about. So why it gained momentum is because of the reasons or the discoveries of why PCOS is happening. Now, as uh, there were discoveries on what exactly PCOS uh, occurs due to the factors is the hormonal imbalance. So when scientists treated on the hormonal imbalances, they even suggested relief methods of how to deal with these hormonal imbalances. The most uh, commonly intervened method was obviously the oral contraceptive pills, which was made by a combination of estrogen and progesterone, the hormones that were found to be imbalanced within the female body. Now, these uh, oral contraceptive pills on consumption relieved these uh, imbalances in the body, uh, relieved the menstrual cyclicity, hirsutism, and acne. Apart from that, the hormonal treatment even included the periodic progesterone withdrawal. There were even administration of anti-androgens. Since we know that there is a hike in the androgen level, that is testosterone level in the female body, to counter this effect, anti-androgens were even injected into patients in order to improve the hormonal imbalances. Now, as we all know, there's also facial acne on and facial hair on the patient's uh, face. So in order to counter that, there were even treatment on mechanical hair removal. Now, this was all the pro of, pros of the hormonal treatment. There are cons of this hormonal treatment as well, as the recent discoveries claim. The, there can be an increase in the cardiovascular risk, as is claimed by the hormonal treatment administration. Even there can be an increased prevalence of hypertension and dyslipidemia, as about 30% of women with hormonal treatment administration reported to have acclaimed with hypertension and dyslipidemia. There was also chances of obstructive sleep apnea. Apart from that, there were also uh, chances, high chances rather, I would say, of insulin resistance later on, even after the treatment. And again, even uh, in 50% of the patient, it was later on claimed to have higher chances of breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer. Now, this was a very much talked about topic and a discovery that was made in the recent researches that many uh, women have been diagnosed with breast cancer who had earlier suffered with PCOS. And this led to uh, the detrimental effect of hormonal treatment coming into light. Next slide, please. So this is all about uh, the seed cycling that we'll be moving into. I hand over to Anurima for the next insights. So thank you, Dishani, for giving us the brief about the four pillars. So it is very interesting. And the most important thing is the hormonal treatment. So many of us are not well aware about the treatment. And the good news for the women who are suffering said, do not please suffer. You can go for the management. And it is uh, like completely, uh, you can get the remission from uh, PCOS. So now we are moving to the very interesting part. And I would like to invite Onurima. So Onurima, I will request to keep in very brief as due to the crunch of time. So people will not be able to stay for a long time. So just give us the idea how seed cycling works, in what way you can incorporate seeds, in what recipes you can do. And at the end, Dishani will share with us the study done at SNDT College uh, University at Mumbai. They have done a very interesting study. So Onurima, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, so first of all, good evening, sir, and all the members who have given their valuable time to join today's session. And uh, thank you, Aruniva and Deshani, for giving beautiful explanation about the introductory part and the dietary modification part. I'm going to explain now the, the important part of this topic for which uh, all was waiting for so long. Uh, I am pretty much sure that uh, everyone wants to know about the word seed cycling, right? So what is the term mean? What exactly the term means? We will see in the next slide. So seeds, we all know, seeds is the superfoods. These are the superfoods which we can get from the mother nature. And the seed cycling is the best way to treat hormonal issues in the female's body. So seed cycling is the practice of eating specific seeds during the two main phases, menstrual cycle, which is follicular and luteal, that helps to balance the estrogen and progesterone level. There are the four seeds which are used in the seed cycle. The flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and sesame seeds. So seeds are very beneficial for our health. 
and there are lots of benefits in the seed cycle. We can move into the next slide. So there are a lot of benefits in the seed cycle. It helps to balance the hormones and regularize periods. It also elevates the menstrual symptoms uh, by balancing the estrogen and progesterone level. It also helps to reduce the symptom of hot flashes, mainly seen on the uh, women uh, who are in the menopausal state and the vaginal dryness also. It helps to reduce the mood swings, fatigue and depression and painful periods also. And the most important is that it helps to reduce the androgen levels, which are positive factor hirsutism in females. So to get this benefit, uh, how we must to meet, we need to incorporate seed cycling in our menstrual phases. So how to incorporate seed cycling in the menstrual phases, we will get to know in the next slide. So how to incorporate seed cycling in the menstrual phases? It's like basically is a, it's quite simple. Uh, it it can be incorporate our daily basis, daily uh, daily diet from the first day of menstrual cycle, which is called follicular phase that has been already discussed in the earlier. And it that this the this phase has the duration of one to fourteen days, and the second phase of the menstrual cycle is known as luteal phase, which is lasts for. 15 to 28 days. So here we can see the picture of seed cycling in the moon phase. So what is the moon phase exactly? Or what is the, the moon phase or how can it is related to the menstrual cycle? Right. So have you ever noticed that the moon phase and the menstrual cycle phase both are 28 days? This is no coincidence. Yes, many females have follows the moon phases in their menstrual cycle. So, menstrual cycle in the on the phases of seed cycling guideline or the moon phase is the first from the first day to 14 day, which is called as a new moon to full moon, and the next cycle is the 15 uh, the days 15 to 28 days is called full moon to new moon. In the first day of uh, of uh, menstrual cycle from day 1 to 14 days, the pumpkin seed and flax seed should be included in your diet. And the next 15 to 28 days, the sunflower seed and the sesame seed should be included in our diet. With this, I have to, I have to want to, I want to add some experience of my work experience. Um, I have come across some patients who were suffering from PCOD and PCOS irregular periods. Uh, at that time, I had included Seed cycling in the, their regular diet after consuming in their uh, after consuming four to five months regularly, they have uh, the, their conditions of the physical disease have improved and the progress was remarkable. So they are got into uh, got some health benefits also of this state. So the seed cycling is the magical process. I I would like to say that. So in the next slide we will discuss the for, for each individual seeds. So first seed is flaxseed. So flaxseed is the plant-based food that provides healthful fat, uh, antioxidant and fiber. And for this, it is called functional food, which can help in prevent disease by removing, mo uh, removing molecules called the free radicals from our body. Next slide, please. So it is the nutritive fact of the flax seeds. Here you can see in the left hand side the nutritive fact of the according to the hundred gram, and in the right hand side the nutritive fact according to the one three tablespoon whole, that is the ten point three gram. And flax seeds also has the uh, low saturated, and it has it contains sodium free and gluten free, and it is uh, rich in fiber also. Please move to the next slide. Oh, the benefits of flaxseed, as we all know, it uh, lowers the cholesterol levels, it lowers the hypertension, and prevents cardiovascular diseases. It maintains blood sugar, and it prevents hot flashes and reduces inflammation. It good for skin and hair growth also. Here is the next slide. So now uh, we will discuss the how flaxseed helps in hormonal balance in PCOD and PCOS. So there are some benefits of flaxseed in the PCOD and PCOS. So it has a uh, 
phytoestrogen and hormone balancing abilities which regulate the body's hormonal imbalances or uh, balance the menstrual cycle basically so the common problem of the pcod pcos is over so they think they that in that time they the fat intake is not for good not good for their health but that's not the right thing right so fat is very, very essential to our body and it should be included in our diet but in the good fat uh, like omega 3 fatty acid which is present in flaxseed and it is reduce the inflammation and promote the blood flow to the uterus it can also assist growth in the body it is rich in fiber also and fiber helps to digest uh, fat, uh like digest which makes you fuller for longer period and reduce the calorie intake which is helped in the weight loss by managing the uh, with water retention in the body it improves metabolism also and lastly very important it contains large amount of lignans in naturally occurring plant uh, based estrogen it may assist your body in eliminating extra androgens produced by the ovaries and balance hormone it is the very commonly seen in the female uh, the ungrow uh, uh, excess hair growth in the uh, chins or uh, chest so by uh, reducing uh, the female uh, hyperandrogenism related symptoms and to include the flaxseed in our diet it reduces the hair growth also going to the next slide So here is the second seed is the pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seed also uh, is a edible seed and it is typically flat and asymmetrical oval and light green in color and it is referred to as a uh, snack roasted in food. Next slide. Here is also the nutritive value of pump, pumpkin seed and uh, here is the nutritive fat of according to 100 per gram and uh, uh, according to the one tablespoon. So a pumpkin seed also has it's it's a good amount of healthy fat fat and fiber. Going to the next slide. So you, so will, you can refer to the IFCTC guideline for the micronutrient yes. and macronutrient 2017 IFCTC. You can refer, you can get each and everything what is discussed uh, about the uh, like nutrient content of this uh, flax seeds or different seeds. Yeah, Arunima, you can Anunima, you can continue. Yeah. So there are some health benefits of pumpkin seeds. Like it is a great source of magnesium, which is reduce the muscle spasm. It is a great source of zinc also, that uh, it naturally prevents the osteoporosis and uh, it contains the L tryptophan, which com this compound affects the against the depression also. It kills the parasite and lowers the cholesterol and Prevent uh, pre uh, to improve the bladder function and prostate fat also. Going to the next slide. So, how pumpkin seeds are held in hormonal balance or PCOD on or from PCOD or PCOS. So now pumpkin seeds are also rich in omega-6 fatty acids, which supports the sex hormone and encourage the reproduction. It improves the estrogen and while also preventing the excess estrogen because excess estrogen can Uh, there is a voice break. You, uh, Anurima, you just keep your video off for a while. The voice is totally breaking now. Yeah, you continue first. So this uh, mineral helps to improve the formation of corpus luteum in the uterus, which is responsible for producing progesterone and stimulates the uterus to thicken in the preparation for potential implantation of fertilized egg. And vitamin E also present in the in this seed, which is reducing the PMS symptoms like uh, fatigue and bloating. Uh, that. Let's move to the next slide. So the third is sunflower seed. The sunflower seed is the seed of the sunflower, and this is the usually classified by the pattern on their husk. If the husk is a solid black the seeds are called black or oil sunflower seeds and they may be called as a 
uh, they may be eaten as a snack food also. Next slide. So here, this is the also, um, nutritive value of the sunflower seed. The nutritive value of the sunflower seed according to the 100 gram and also the one tablespoon we can see in the slide. Next slide, please. So here are some health benefits of sunflower seed. So it preventing the heart diseases, it maintain the it maintain the neurological and uh, mental health also. It reducing the cholesterol and reducing the risk of osteoporosis and arthritis. It good for skin health also. Next slide, please. How sunflower seed helps in hormonal imbalance or PCOD or PCOS. So it is high in vitamin E which is the improves the endometrial thickness in the controlled ovarian stimulation and it boosts cholesterol production and the selenium is the main ingredient in the in this thing so selenium helps detox the liver of on the excess estrogen this helps reduce excess estrogen during luteal phase when estrogen declines and cholesterol rises if a liver cannot remove estrogen properly, it poorly metabolized and gets reabsorbed in the body, leading to the hormonal imbalance, also several liver diseases. Moving to the next slide. So last and the important seed is sesame seed. Sesame seed also called as a bene, and it is the highest oil con con content of this any seed. And it is also in with a nutty flavor and with this in oil. Next slide, please. Here is the nutritive fact of sesame seed, and it is according to the 100 gram and also in the one tablespoon gram. Health benefits of sesame seed. So, there are some points of health benefits in it improves the bone health and it decreases the cholesterol. Boost immunity, controls the blood pressure, uh, its anti cancerous properties, reduces the weight loss, fights oxidative stress, and also cures the inflammation. Next slide, please. So, how sesame seeds helps in hormonal imbalance or PCOD and PCOS? So, sesame seeds reduce the testosterone levels and increase the insulin absorption. It reach in source of the thing and which mainly helps to boost cholesterol production and health evolution in the woman. It also contains lignans which help to block excess estrogen during the second phase of the menstrual cycle. It increases the vitamin E circulating throughout the body, thus helping the woman maintaining their cholesterol level. Next slide, please. So now it is important to know how much quantity of the seed to be consumed in the cycling process. So Day 1 to 14 of the cycle, uh, 1 to 2 teaspoons of ground flaxes and pumpkin seeds should be included in the diet. And the day 15 to 28 of the of this cycle, the 1 to 2 teaspoons ground sunflower seed and sesame seed should be included in the diet. The maximum doses as per the tolerance and seasonal specificity is 1 tablespoon, not more than that. Next slide, please. So there are detrimental effects of seed. When excess amount of seed has been consumed, then some common side effects occur. Some people are sensitive to some seeds, so they may suffer from some digestive problems and allergies also. So when we should consuming seeds, under we should need to consult first uh, uh, the experienced dietitian, and then we should consume the seed. Next slide. Now here are some important tips about the how can we prepare or how, how can we consume the seeds properly in the proper way so many people don't know how to prepare seeds properly so we should not consume whole seeds because whole seeds are very hard to digest in the human body and to fully absorb all the nutrients of the seed by our body we should take ground seeds to make ground seeds uh, we can uh, grind them in the grinder and make a fine powder and store the leftover powder in the glass container and uh, in the freezer to keep them fresh because seeds uh, goes rancid quickly and lose nutritional value like 
marketed pre-ground seeds has higher chances of oxidizing and becoming rancid, which are unhealthy to consume. Next slide, please. And there are some various ways to include seeds into our meals, into like blending them, smoothing, sprinkling them on the oatmeal bowls, yogurt. And there are a lot of options. The options are truly endless. So I am finished my part here. And I'm inviting Vishani for some interesting recipe and present the case study and research paper also. So we have five more minutes, five or ten minutes. So Vishani, just give a glance of the recipes. And at the end, the studies are important. So please discuss the studies. So kindly go first. So here I'm discussing some of the interesting recipes where you can incorporate seeds into. You can incorporate them in some video salads. You oh. can switch on your video. Just, yes, sir. So you can incorporate them in uh, fruit, uh, mixed fruit porridges or salads or even in, uh, in terms of uh, giving in smoothies, uh, some salad dressings as well. Uh, apart from that, uh, you can even incorporate them as parathas, theplas, laddus, khakras, etc. Next slide, please. So as I said, these are some of the demonstrations of the recipes where you can incorporate seed cycling into it. Next slide, please. So this was a study that we conducted at SNDD Women's University where we developed a product specially designed for the target population of women suffering from PCOS or PCOD. We developed a uh, actually two varieties of khakra. The first variety having flaxseed and pumpkin seed that was administered to the women suffering from PCOS or PCOD. And they were asked to consume it with, from day 1 to day 14. Those women having the menstrual cycle and those who did not have the menses were asked to have it from the new moon up to the full moon. And the next, that is the sesame and sunflower seed khakra in the luteal phase, that is from day 15 to day 28 of the menstrual cycle or from the full moon phase to the next new moon phase. Now, these were the nutritional values of the khakra. The first, as you can see the highlights of it, the flaxseed and pumpkin seed khakra, you can see about four servings of the khakra give about 106.8 of uh, mg of calcium, magnesium being about approximately 150 mg, selenium to 44.7 uh, micrograms, and zinc to about 2.8 uh, mg. The approximate shelf life that we had was about, about seven days, although we counseled the participants on how they can even make these khakras at their home as well. Next slide, please. This is about the sunflower and the sesame seed khakra. You can see here as well the calcium content due to the addition of sesame seeds being about 164.4 mg, the magnesium being 144 mg approximately, selenium being 43.3 micrograms, and zinc again being 3 mg. This again was a, having a shelf life of seven days without the use of any preservatives. Next slide, please. Now, here are some of the studies that have been done regarding seed cycling. I'll be uh, just focusing on what exactly the study was. It was mainly aimed at having a flaxseed uh, supplementation to women suffering from PCOS, where they were asked to consume about 30 grams of flaxseed powder, along with some lifestyle modification was asked uh, into their lifestyle for 12 weeks, that is approximately three months. The anthropometric and biochemical parameters were evaluated pre and post the study for examination. The results were quite convincing where it showed that there was significant reduction in the body weight. There was a uh, reduction in insulin concentration, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which we know as a high inflammatory marker. There was reduction in the leptin concentration as well. And on the contrary, there was an increase in the high density lipoprotein, that is HDL or the good cholesterol. The adiponectin levels also elevated compared to the baseline parameters. Now, it was uh, con convincing that uh, flaxseed supplementation along with lifestyle modification was effective in improving the uh, symptoms and relieving the symptoms of PCOS. Next slide, please. Coming to another study. So this was done by Pakistan Biomedical Journal. This was basically an aggregation of uh, many articles or research papers. And it was a review article which aimed at uh, evaluating about 150 articles which due to the exclusion criteria curtailed to about 98 articles that read about the relevance of omega-3 fatty acids and its importance in PCOS, that is predominantly in seed cycling, as we know, omega-3 fatty acids being a high, in, uh, high concentration being found in the seeds as well. 
So it also had convincing results that omega-3 fatty acids were the main component in the seeds from plant sources, which improved the hormonal dis uh, disturbances and insulin resistance as well in PCOS patients. Coming to the next slide, here is a brief case study uh, where a 17-year-old teen who uh, presented with secondary amenorrhea, rather PCOS, uh, had consulted her pediatrician along with her mother, who was suggested on oral contraceptive pills, whose mother was receptive upon uh, administering uh, OCPs to such young age to her child. Therefore, she uh, recommended a nutritionist who therefore guided her into having seed cycling. So just uh, in the next slide, we'll discuss what exactly the intervention was made. Next slide, please. So in the first appointment, it's seed cycling, where uh, the, in the follicular phase itself, she was suggested of having amenorrhea resulted for about five months and more than five months. Therefore, a high dose that is about 15 grams, that is the maximum dosage of one tablespoon of flaxseed and pumpkin seed was suggested to her every day until the luteal phase. From day 15 to day 28, uh, she was suggested to having sunflower seeds and sesame seeds, each one tablespoon for the rest of her uh, luteal phase. Now, the patient actually reported to having her periods being back just in eight days after the first appointment, which was a startling uh, pediatrician as well as uh, the nutritionist as well. The seed cycling, therefore, induced in the case, had a creative way in increasing the total caloric and healthy fat intake uh, to support her menstrual cycling. At her fifth month checkup after the first appointment, it was uh, revealed that the patient had reduced some amount of her dietary restrictions that were previously imposed on her. She was previously having gluten uh, restriction and lactic acid restrictions, which were considerably reduced later on due to the inclusion of the seed cycling. And she was back to some amount of gluten in her diet. And she even reported a normal, that is 30 day menstrual cycle as well. So coming to that, uh, to the next slide, we have the conclusion or the takeaway note. Next slide, please. So here's the takeaway note that we have. Basically, as we know, there are many. Uh, she got a pause, right, right, Fatma? Yes, sir. Okay. So this uh, is all. Huh. Dishani, are you I back? Can yeah, Arunima, you can conclude. All right. I think uh, I am having also some internet issues, so I'm not putting my video on. <clears throat> well, to conclude, just to say we need to think a little bit out of the box. We are already exposed to many of the medicines, surgical procedures, many of the treatment, right? So let's find some new route and let's incorporate as the case study is suggesting. But we need to remember the thing, seed cycling is something very natural. It doesn't have uh, any kind of, uh, you know, detrimental effects. But yeah, up to a certain extent, uh, there might be some side effects. But under a clinical... Overdosing. You, you mean to say that overdosing is not good? Whatever right. the... the certified, uh, how exactly. much teaspoon or gram is suggested in the slides. Exactly. So you should adhere to that. We should not take exactly. anything in overdosing. Maybe it is a functional food also. But overdosing, it can have some detrimental. So up Same to a considerable can... amount, we can have uh, yes. seeds into our diet and not overdosing or over exceeding the limit is the basic takeaway thing that we have from the presentation. Today. And there is numerous studies, even one study is done in Kolkata on fenugreek seeds and diabetes. So it was done in SSKM hospital that also suggests that same thing that overdosing uh, creates very much flatulence, diarrhea and severe chronic uh, abdominal pains. So this can, this can happen. So sometimes overdosing is, uh, we, sh we should rest it. Even for the EPA, DHA, these are the good fats in the direct form. Uh, so flax seeds, these are omega-3. And when we are taking the form of DHA or EPA, and overdosing is create, doesn't have the beneficial effect. Ulta, uska, detrimental effect, we can have that. Mm -hmm. So we are concluding and uh, move on to the next slide. And uh, Dishan, do you want to say anything? Oh, yes, Actually, sir, definitely. So, muted like last yes, sir. Time. Yes, sir. So, thanking everyone for our, uh, especially our audience, for their patient listening. For the long session, you have been patient enough to listen to us. Thanking everyone, especially I would like to thank Cognize, sir, being the backbone of our uh, entire team, the members for being constantly supportive in every possible way. 
especially sir i can uh, say that no amount of gratitude can be actually enough to be equivalent to the efforts or the tireless efforts that you are putting into us motivating us in each and every way possible because not just knowledge as we know is important even motivation to uh, to do something uh, new each day is what makes us excellent in uh, in our career as well so that is what the small amount of inputs that you give to us each and every day thanking you and the entire faculty and thank members you, of our cognizant team thank you so much for the inspiring words and i always try to motivate the upcoming dietitians uh, and the nutritionists so uh, one thing we can understand fatma you can stop sharing the skin screen so one thing we can understand that uh the confidence among the dietitian is very much important because we have to fight with the each and every part of the society even sometimes we have to fight back with the uh like doctors also and patients have a very lay ideas on that so coming to the questions right away without wasting any time so mr chandan kundu uh, senior dietitian from bangladesh is there so there are many dietitians in, in today have joined even one or two of my gynecological gynecologist friend have also joined today so thanks to all the audience for keeping your patience and now we will move to the dietitians uh, to take the questions even sangeeta mondol senior dietitians is there so sangeeta i will request you to uh, have some if you have some questions we can take your question ha huh. mr chandan and obviously many comments are coming in the comment box and if you uh, those who are present right now so i have shared a link on gdm gestational diabetes uh, it will be done by novo so it will be on uh, 10th of uh, right uh, 10th of uh, this month march 5 pm so you have to just click on that link so you will get the uh, joining link in the facebook so you have to click on the link and Have to select the seats. Okay, so any question from the audience? Yes, sir. One question I have: If a person is having continuous uh, menstrual period for one to two months, then how hmm. when we incorporate seed cycling for how? I mean, can maybe can we start like that? You 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 mean to say it is ceased or she is she is not having menstrual cycle? She is having continuous for one month, sir. Continuous. For one month, yeah. That is that is the four days phase of bleeding phase. You are telling that it is continued. Yeah, it is continued. Okay, so this so how can we incorporate? Uh, yeah, seed cycling. How can we incorporate? From which phase we have to start? Okay, okay, Miss Kavita. So these are the things. Uh, these are the uh, exceptional things. So those who have done the study, uh, Dishani, do you want to in, uh, say anything? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, as the as I said about the study that was done, so one of our participant from the study to whom we had intervened with that khakra had also a similar kind of problem that she was having a menses for constantly one and a half month. So what we did was we asked her that you start off with the full moon phase. As I said, uh, even Anurima had even well, highlighted on the off. new moon. Vishani can switch on your video. All the speakers. Uh, some. Am I visible? Yeah. 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 so uh, what uh, anurima has even highlighted on the new moon and the full moon phase we guided her to have these seeds starting from the flax seed and the pumpkin seed uh, taking into guidance the full moon that uh, amavasya say the new moon starting it from the new moon have 1 teaspoon of flax seed and pumpkin seeds each day up to the full moon that is purnima from the purnima itself start having 1 teaspoon each of sesame and sunflower up to the next new moon that is amavasya so in this way it regularized her periods in about 2 months of time when we had a follow up with the patient it was suggested uh, she came up with the fact that within 2 months of phase this uh, irregularity in her has uh, has actually ceased thank you thank you so much thank for the inputs i am very you. fortunate uh, iladi has joined iladi is very ila roy miss ila roy is very senior dietitian who was the chief dietitian in medical college kolkata and she was the former ida president for west bengal chapter iladi thank you for joining and motivating our students uh, so there are many senior dietitians we are learning each and every day from the seniors and we, if we get motivation from the senior madam or sir so it will be a great thing for us so hi ladi bolun 
thank you all uh, for joining this type of uh, educational uh, seminar and i am also reached with your uh, lectures uh, all of you are, have given uh, some suggestions uh, for uh, pcos uh, food habit should be thank you all so every day didi the science is changing new new research are coming every day so we are also updating from our students we are getting updated from our students it's a good idea for yes students. yes মানে ওরা পড়ছে ওরা আমাদের পড়াচ্ছে ওরা এখন আপকামিং জেনারেশন ওরা যেগুলো নতুন নতুন ইনফরমেশন গুলো নিয়ে কাজ করছে দিশা নিয়ে আমাদের এখানকারই স্টুডেন্ট বেঙ্গলের কিন্তু এখন এস এন ডিটিতে ও পড়াশোনা করেছে ওখানে রিসার্চ করেছে সো আমরা অনেকগুলো জিনিস জানতে পারলাম ফ্রম দা স্টাডি আমিও অনেক কিছু জানলাম ওদের কাছ থেকে যেরকম ফ্ল্যাক সিড বা তোমার হচ্ছে পাম্পিং সিড সানফ্লাওয়ার সিড এগুলো যে কিভাবে খেতে হয় কতটা করে খেতে হবে তার জন্য যে কত আমরা অবশ্যই এমনি জেনারেলি খেতাম কিন্তু পিসিওস পেশেন্টদের জন্য কত বেশি উপকার হয় এগুলো আজকে যারা স্টুডেন্টরা আছে আমরা যারা নিউট্রিশনিস্ট আমরা অনেক জিনিস ফেলি না আমরা ডিসকার্ড করি না কিন্তু অনেক জিনিস আমরা খেয়ে নিই যেটা পুরোনো দিনে অনেক পুরোনো ধরো আমাদের প্যারেন্টসরা আমাদের খাইয়েছে এই জিনিসগুলো কিন্তু এখনকার যারা আছে বাচ্চারা তারা সবাই এটা খাই খেলে একটু চিন্তার বিষয় শুধু নিউট্রিশনিস্টরা খেলেই হবে না খাওয়াতে হবে কমিউনিটিকে কমিউনিটিকে হ্যাঁ কমিউনিটিকে খাওয়াতে হবে তা না হলে কিন্তু কমিউনিটি কিন্তু আস্তে আস্তে প্রবলেম গুলো শুরু হয়ে যাবে হয়তো একশো দেড়শো বছর পরে দেখা যাবে যে ভীষণ ভাবে আমরা অনেক রকম নতুন নতুন যেগুলো অনেক পুরোনো ডিজিজ ছিল হয়তো দুশো বছর আগে যে ডিজিজ গুলো ছিল সেই ডিজিজ গুলো হয়তো আমাদের চলে আসছে যেহেতু আমাদের ফুড হ্যাবিটটা চেঞ্জ হয়ে গেছে रेगुलर बाड़ी आसे कूमड़ो पाम्पिन सीड मुड़ी मोआ खई दिए मोआ बना तो मध्य दिए दी हाँ नारकेल नाड़ुरे स्कूल भात डिम से खाले दरकार आज जिन खबर 
নাম্বার অফ স্টুডেন্ট অনুযায়ী হবে এক্স্যাক্টলি যেটা ওই সিসমে সিট বলল তিল বাটা আমি তো আমার বাড়িতে এখন পোস্ট তো আসে না সো উই ইউজ তিল বাটা তিল বাটাটা খুব ভালো তিল এম তিল তো খুব ভাগ দিল খুব মিষ্টি সিসম সিটটা এর মধ্যেই আছে চারটি সিটের মধ্যে সিসম আছে হ্যাঁ তবু সিসম খায় আগে তো তিল তেল খাওয়া হতো হুম তবে তারও আগে তিল তেলটাকে অ্যাকচুয়ালি প্রদীপ জ্বালাতো মানে আমরা কত ইগনোরেন্ট ছিলাম তিল দিয়ে তিলটা মানে সর্ষে তেলকে যত প্রাধান্য দিত একদম প্রথমে তিল তেল খেত তারপরে যখন সর্ষে তেল যখন আবিষ্কার হলো তখন তিল তেলটাকে ওই প্রদীপ জ্বালানোর জন্য ব্যবহার করতো তারপরে আবার চেঞ্জ হয়েছে আবার আমাদের টাইমে তিল তিলকে তেল তেল তো এখন হয় না খুব একটা করে না তিল ডাইরেক্টলি বিভিন্ন রকম ভাবে বানানো হয় মানে প্রোডাক্ট নানা রকম হিসেবে বানানো আমিও কিছুদিন করেছি অনেক শিখেছি কলকাতা তোমরা যদি কোনো কমিউনিটিতে গিয়ে কাজ করতে চাও তাহলে আমি সেখানে গিয়ে কিছু আমি তোমাদের জন্য Sir, you are on mute, sir. Sir, uh, Mr. Chandan has asked for the child and the pregnant. So, child, it is not unsafe. But for the pregnant mother, we should be very cautious on giving anything extra. Even it is a functional food also. So, we have to because I, have, I find some gestational diabetes patient trying methy seed or fenugreek and they are getting high. So, whatever they should consume, in what amount, they should con- consult a doctor or a senior dietitian or a uh, certified dietitian otherwise uh, anything uh, is uh, if in dishani if you or arunima if you want to add any point to mr chandan's question he has asked that which seed is, seed is not safe for child and pregnant is there any seed which is not safe i think everything is safe yes. but so we, every seed is basically safe up to the limit actually so anything we are incorporating we need to be very careful as uh, shomendu sir has already addressed this uh, it has been found like uh, if we consider on ayurvedic concept it has been found that seeds are little bit warm in nature so okay. you know in yes. case of pregnancy we found some kind of discomfort platulence bloating it's a very common problem so that should be as minimal as possible and obviously under a certified uh, clinical nutritionists or doctors or practicing dietitians guidance okay so thank you all uh, for connecting so uh, we will share more topics in the next topic which is coming is misbranding so we are taking masala oats we are taking oats biscuit tar moddhe koto khotikarok jinish ache shei ta topic ta niye we are next coming soon and there are many topic coming in this month which are done by the nutrition students uh, so we will move forward so if we don't have any question any question in the chat box dishani no more question so there's one more i guess uh, you you take the question please yeah it says how, how long we have to continue the seed sacking se- uh, treatment so basically until and unless your menses are back to normal you can continue it up to the safe portion as i said 1 teaspoon that is 5 grams of each of the seeds can be consumed each uh, each day uh, that is initially with starting with flax seed and pumpkin seed and uh, from the next phase that is luteal phase onwards sunflower and the sesame seeds each being 5 uh, uh, grams each 5 uh, uh, grams or 1 t- uh, tablespoon or teaspoon each
Harurima, is it okay or anything more you want to add? Yeah, usually the menses do. Uh, usually the menses do come within a limit of one changes. month. Right. Still, we are finding any kind of noticeable changes. At least consumption will lead to some effect. Uh, at least some point we will definitely reach. So whenever you are finding some changes, you can find by yourself and you can really add on to that, like whether you should continue or not. And obviously, you can visit a practicing dietitian for the further more invention, intervention. Okay. I would like to thank all of you for being so lovely audience. And uh, in that day also, we are still having 43 people with us. Thank you so much. Hope uh, yes, almost 100 people has joined today. Right. That's a success of us. And a big Singha, Chandrimadi is there. Chandrimadi, Juma, Juma, you are there. Jyoti, you have any feedback? Jyoti Parisa, she is also a very academic person. Jyoti, love do you want to share? I'd love to know feedbacks from everybody. Jyoti, you need to unmute. Mira, madam, do you want to say anything? Mira, ma'am, from Chennai. Mira, Venugopalan, ma'am. No, sir, yeah. it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. That's all for me. Okay. So I am just checking the uh, chat box and the audience. So no more question. So we are just uh, concluding here. And thanks all for joining today. Thank you so much. Good night.